Brought to you by Nordic Podcast. Us, uh, we're joined with Steve Sarowitz. Now, a lot of people in the um, sector of, uh, you know, the digital sector must have heard of him. Uh, he has been the founder of um, a payroll uh, digitalized company in the 19. 19- uh, 90s that has obviously more or less uh, revolutionized that sector and today uh, we see him in um, f- production in films we see him uh, spread all over uh, various different uh, interests but he's still a runner at heart he still loves his long distance running and uh, he made that really clear uh, it's the first time we have with us uh, also actually a Baha'i on the podcast, which uh, is amazing. And um, we would love to hear basically what what made Steve Steve, you know? <laughs> you're, you're this combination of all sorts of amazing uh, puzzles and pieces, right? There are not that many, let's say, athletes uh, and, and spiritual people to turn billionaire. It's kind of like, wait a minute. What what makes this clock tick? And uh, we'll go on from there, you know. We'll just take it easy, take it slow. So welcome, Steve. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. We're all just uh, human beings, every one of us equal in our own way. Some of us are richer, some of us are poorer, some of us taller or shorter or faster or slower. But uh, we're all just part of the human family. Love it. Love it. So honestly, one thing I want to go into before we really, you know, start dissecting things. How is the pandemic go? Like, how did that hit you guys over there? Because here in Norway, you know, we're going up and down in terms of lockdowns. And um, even economically, you know, it has it has been kind of rough. But in terms of both your reaction to it when it just started the early days last year. And um, I kind of also want to hear your point of view about this whole thing, you know? What I found is that it affected the whole world. Um, The pandemic affected the whole world. It was interesting Mm. because I found that people have gone one of two ways in America, and I don't know if it's the same way in Norway. the world to me is first and, first and foremost a spiritual world. When I was younger, somebody said to me that the spiritual world was the real world and the material world was the shadow world. And I didn't understand this at all. I literally, I'm like, there's a table there, there's a table, don't tell me about the spiritual world. I thought, you know, I thought I had a soul, but I didn't understand the predominance of the spiritual world until I really started studying the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i writings. Now that I understand that, That's the the prism, the lens that I look at the entire world through. And so what I find with the pandemic is I believe that God is testing humanity. In America, we had a lot of challenges, not just with the pandemic, but with racism, with politics. And I believe God is asking us, testing us to see what we choose. Do we choose love over hate? Do we choose unity over division? And so I think we're seeing the results of choosing hate over love and division over unity Um, in all things, not just the pandemic, but the fact that we had rioting in the streets and and various problems. And we have had problems with race in America for a long time, but also throughout the world. This is not an American problem. This is a worldwide problem. And the question is, how long will it come? How long will it take for us to come to our senses and realize that we are one human family? And that each member of that family needs to be treated like a full human being. Until we collectively realize this, we will continue to have problems like the pandemic. We will continue to have problems like the racial unrest in America. And and when I say that, I mean that as a as a holistic thing, that we are racism is causing problems in America. The persecution of people due to the color of their skin, the lack of equity and equality and unity in our society, merely because of something as, as I would say, as a Baha'i, as accidental as the color of someone's skin, we should be looking at the color of people's hearts, and and we're not. And so until we start doing that on a global level, we will still have these problems. And the the pandemic brought this to a forefront, I think, really for us to see if we want to see it. 
exactly because you know i really resonate with what you said and um it is as to say you know no virtue or deed can be uh, described as a virtue or a deed unless it is tested right and uh, these tests will absolutely uh, come in different forms and this is a global test this is absolutely a, 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 the pandemic was at a global scale and we are really put into this situation where we need to take a step back and realize that as spiritual beings there are certain things that we haven't fulfilled that need to be not only collectively accepted as us failing to fulfill it even 200 years ago but coming together collectively and acknowledging that before and until these things are done racial equality equality between the sexes etc we cannot progress as a society either materially or spiritually and i really like that um point that you stressed on the other thing that what i've seen is that there's a, so, a i'm sorry if i'm missing cuz of the lag i'm seeing a lot of people and i have been throughout my adult life a lot of people turning away from god so in america and i believe in in norway as well people have turned away from god mm. especially young people and said you know we don't need god in our lives we don't need religion there's a negative view of religion and i always say to them the same thing i always say i don't believe in the religion you don't believe in i don't believe in the god you don't believe in i don't believe in a god of war uh, intolerance division of hatred I don't believe in a god of hypocrisy. I don't believe a god in a god that goes against reason, logic and science. I don't believe in a harshly intolerant and judgmental god that wants you or or your friend to go to hell. I don't believe in that that god at all and I don't believe in that religion. And the Baha'i faith says if that's the type of religion you are practicing, it's better to have no religion. And a lot of people have got that part of the Baha'i writings and they do it and that's great. And and actually the Bahai writings even say that it's truly a religious act to abandon that type of false religion. But the very next line in the Bahai writings this is from Abdul Baha says but we must embrace divine religion true religion. And what is true religion? It's love and it's kindness and it's mercy and it's compassion. But it's one more thing and I think young people are missing this. It's divine guidance. And this is very important. how do we lead our lives is it okay to drink do drugs to have sex with whoever you want whenever you want um possibly you know I, i'm not going to tell someone not to do any of these things cuz i'm a bahai and i don't enforce my beliefs on anyone else but i would say upright conduct is a good thing for society it's good for us not to lie to murder to steal and these things are in all the holy books yeah and i would say that you know and i'll pick on one thing uh alcohol kills over 3 million people a year worldwide just as many as the pandemic killed and bahawullah said alcohol was bad for you so whereas i wouldn't force anyone not to drink hmm. i would argue that or at least put forth that possibly bahawullah was right in his and so this idea of, of of leaning into divine guidance as a loving guidance from a loving god i think is something that society is is in america very much missing exactly um and it's 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 actually a really good parallel you brought with um you know the example of alcohol for example we actually see in norway and in japan let me talk about norway and scandinavia specifically we actually see that um there's a really high rate of people who consider themselves atheists parallel to that there is a really high wa- uh, rate of um alcohol abuse and suicides but what's interesting what's very interesting is these countries are also all, almost always on the top 3 ranked happiest country or best countries to live in and prosper materially right so we have a very strange um let's say juxtaposition where you have everything you would need materially present in a country but there's a huge lack 
of what one would consider deep spiritual joy and we see this in the form of unfortunate really high suicide rates and drug abuse and a person would probably ask wait a minute isn't happiness solely based on comfort if you have everything why is the depression why is the suicide rate so high you know it's it's such a beautiful country to live in and it's always in the top three on paper there is no reason for these horribly high suicide rates or alcohol abuse or drug abuse on paper there is absolutely no reason for this but that comes back to what you were saying and what you were talking about and obviously what the Baha'i writings talk about is how not only does spirituality and true happiness go hand in hand because as spiritual beings you know you can only truly be happy if you dwell in the spirit if you dwell in uh, uh, virtues and connotations that help grow the spirit but even true material prosperity is not possible as a civilization without that having to be in place and i always find the parallels fascinating especially living in norway where i do see people who honestly man they have everything they have everything materially and they and this scares them because imagine you're a 14 year old kid right and um you're home and you actually feel a huge lack but when you take a step back and you look at your life you go wait a minute i have a roof over my head i'm doing well in school i'm comfortable why am i so sad or why is there why is this huge lack uh, you know or this dark cloud above my head and it's really difficult for them to figure this out from scratch if one doesn't instill th- that spiritual side of it so i mean have you ever yourself um have you visited scandinavia no uh, my business partner i was going to say my business partner is in sweden right now and I would love to come to Norway, but only if you can introduce me to Jakob Ingebretsen or maybe his mm. brother Henrik or, or, or Philip. You know, just one of the one of the Ingebretsens would be good. <laughs> um, no, I'd love to come to Scandinavia. Uh, you're, you know what? I'll try to. I will try to. I'm, I'm actually coming, hopefully, to the UK uh, in July. I, the closest I usually get is Northern Ireland um, and, and London. Um, I have a business in Northern Ireland that services mm. the UK. I also have an international payroll company, although perhaps I might be selling it in the near future. Um, and that international payroll company does business all over the world, including Norway. So I do business in Norway. So I should come and meet my partner in Norway. That would be kind of cool. Fantastic. I've, I've never, so I've never been to Norway. I'd love to go. Yeah, we um, think you should. But I want to address what you said about this having everything. So I, as, as a billionaire as one of the richest people in the world, one of the richest people in America, um, I think I'm probably right around the edge of the, what they call the Forbes 400 here in America, one of the 400 richest people in America. Um, it's, you know, I, I have it first here with my family, right. with my kids. I have two 18-year-old kids, and, and, and the challenge is not to provide them too much materially. One of the things I've always told them is you're going to have to work. I had a friend, I have a friend who was a... Um, He was a financial, uh, he was an advisor, uh, relationship manager with wealthy people. And what he said to me, he said the dividing line between the rich people who were happy and the rich people who weren't happy, and this was the the heirs to, to, let's say, 5, 10, 20, $50 million fortunes, uh, the, the dividing line was not how much money they inherited, but rather did they work. He said if they worked and they had a purpose, that was always better than if they didn't work. Because imagine you inherit $50 million or $100 million, and you never have to work a day in your life. You have no purpose in life. So that, that's still a material way of looking at it. I go one step further and say, for my children, I don't wish that they're rich like me. I don't wish that they're not rich. I have no desire for them to continue on the family fortune. I want my children to be good human beings. If possible, I would like to gift them the Baha'i faith. Neither one of them is a Baha'i as of yet. That would be the greatest gift I could give them. Um, what, no amount of money. In fact, for me, no, I would not trade my faith for any amount of money. And my favorite thing to buy as a billionaire is Baha'i books. Literally buy the box full and give them away. 
Um, <laughs> in my community in Highland Amazing. Park, Illinois, we, we are like a little Norway. We have lots of problems with depression and a lot of problems with the young people here having severe problems with drugs and alcohol and anxiety. And yet we're the community. And, and I, I want to use this term. We've papered over the problem. On the surface, you don't see it. It's all underneath the water because we, with materialism, we all have nice cars. We have, or most of us have nice cars, nice houses. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful community with a lot of tall trees. And yet underneath this beautiful, lovely community with the lovely houses and the cars is suffering. And to me, all joy, well, if you look at all the good things in life, joy and happiness and love and mercy and compassion, truth and beauty, all of those are spiritual virtues. They're not physical. You know, beauty, you could argue, is physical, but but really beauty, true beauty is spiritual. The true beauty, when you, if you looked at a plastic tree versus a living tree, the living tree would always be more beautiful. And the same thing with people. You could see the most uh, beautiful person, man or woman, um, walk by you. But if you knew that person and they were ugly on the inside, they would no longer look so beautiful to you. And you could see someone who might not be as attractive physically, but has just a, a radiant mm -hmm. personality. And they would gradually seem more attractive to you. Hopefully, if you're if you're in tune spiritually. Yeah, exactly. It's it's almost like, um, you know, the, the writings say, you know, if you look for the signs of God, you'll see it everywhere. And that that kind of shows like you're saying, you know, the, the beauty, if you look for true inherent beauty, whether it's a tree, whether it's a person, it will come down to the virtues they inhibit or the, the non-material side, the spirit that they inhabit within them. And absolutely, this is the essence of, you could say the essence of beauty itself. It's, it's what's within. And not only that, but it's how it's expressed because even something as simple as kindness or uh, uh, pick any virtue, uh, chastity or, or um, selflessness, all these things are expressed as well very differently from person to person. And that also is what gives us this personality that people fall in love with, right? A beautiful personality. The expression of a virtue is beautiful. So I'm wondering now, like, because you were actually born in a Jewish family, right? So when did the Baha'i faith cross your path? At what stage in your life? And um, how, how you know, did you first receive it? Um, so I first heard about it when I was about 19 or 20. I was a college student. And I went to the Jewish Student Center, which is called Hillel, at the University of Illinois. And this, there was a Baha'i presenter. And he presented this concept called progressive revelation. He said, a single God has progressively revealed the truth through his messengers. And he goes through all the messengers, Krishna and Abraham and Moses and Zoroaster and Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad. And he's showing how God has progressively revealed the truth in every age. And finally, to the Bab and Baha'u'llah. And this just made so much sense to me. So my first impression was very positive because it was so logical. Before, I had been Jewish, and I'd never really understood. To be honest, I'd never made any attempt to understand what Christians believed. All I knew was I was a little scared because Christians didn't particularly like me. They'd killed all my relatives in the Holocaust, and most of the people who uh, killed my relatives were nominally, nominally Christian, and Christians had done a lot of bad things to Jews over the years. I myself had been beaten up by people who were nominally Christian um, when I was in fourth grade and had a swastika drawn in my locker while I was in high school. So I'd had some things even done to me personally, not a lot, but enough for me to know that anti-Semitism existed. And I was a, I was a little bit scared. Mm. I had, knew I'd been taught that we were right and they were wrong, but that didn't make a lot of sense to me because there's 2 billion Christians and there's only 15 million Jews. Just the odds are that we, you know, I might want to at least understand what they were thinking. And so when I saw this Baha'i presentation, it made more sense to me than the Jews are right and the Christians are wrong, or the Muslims are right and the Christians are wrong, or the Christians are right. You know, this whole idea that Abdul Baha talks about that my religion is right and your religion is wrong. I didn't do anything with this for 
many years. And it wasn't uh, until over 20 years later that I started studying the Baha'i faith in earnest. I was in my 40s at this time. And I started studying in my early to mid 40s. I started studying the Baha'i faith. I had a, a, mm. a running partner who, who was a Baha'i, is a Baha'i. Uh, he's not my running partner anymore because he's uh, disabled now. But he, uh, he wonderful Baha'i by the name of Tim Hendershot. And oh. we were running together. And uh, Tim asked me eventually to go to a Baha'i study group. And I went and I loved it and I kept doing it. And after a few years, I went home to my wife, who is Catholic and she's Hispanic. So we're a typical Baha'i couple. We don't look quite alike. Um, I'm six foot six. She's five foot one. I'm a little lighter. She's a little darker. Um, I said to her, I said, I'm a Baha'i now. And she says, no, you're not. You have to wait until after the kids bar mitzvah. So I sat down to wait the two and a half years uh, until after our children's bar mitzvah. And because we, we had agreed to raise them Jewish and God had other plans for me. Uh, he interceded and I went at that point. I my company, Paylocity, was just going public. And so we'd come into all this money and I wanted to do something good. So I called up a man by the name of Bill Strickland right around this time. And I said, Bill, I'd like to do something in Chicago. He said, I want to build a center. You built centers. And he, he did. He built this beautiful center in Pittsburgh. I wanted to do something for people in the city of Chicago. So we started building the center. And about the fifth or sixth conversation, Bill says to me, I want to build a center in Akko, Israel for Jews and Arabs. And I said, Bill, did you just say Akko, Israel? He said, yes. He said, why Akko, Israel? Well, because Jews and Arabs get along better there. And I said, well, maybe the issue isn't... Um, that Jews and Arabs get along better in Akko. Maybe the issue is Akko itself. And I said, I told him about the Baha'i faith and how I wanted to be a Baha'i. And I said, Bill, by the way, um, you have a friend or had a friend who's passed away by the name of Dizzy Gillespie. And I said, Dizzy Gillespie, like me, pray to Akko every day. And so, you know, every Baha'i turns towards Akko to pray because it's it's our Mecca. And so I went to the Baha'i Mecca, the, the holiest place in the Baha'i world, to Akko. And I stepped inside the shrine of Baha'u'llah, who's, who's buried there, and actually, actually just outside the shrine, and I had a complete spiritual transformation, and I've never been the same since, and I'm very happy not being the same. Um, I'm just in love with the Baha'i faith and tell everyone about it every day, and within a few months, I, I didn't make it to the bar mitzvah, within a few months after that, less than six months later, I had declared. That's, that's fantastic. That's a beautiful journey of... Um realization of um, independent search for the truth which is a pillar in the baha'i faith and uh, honestly it, it takes a lot of energy right it's almost like you have to shift tectonic plates when you are i'll use the word diverging from a cultural identity because it's it's almost i mean it is a cultural identity you know judaism and being jewish and there's lots of roots that is tied into that. So um, definitely one of the hardest, uh, let's say, pivotal points for man is to change such a cultural identity. And I might even add at such a mature age, right? Because one tends to be stuck in one's old ways. You know, it's harder to, to bend a tree or an oak than, you know, a, a, a vine. So... It must have taken absolute superhuman focus and independent investigation of the truth. And um, probably an open mind is, is a must-have, right? So how did your immediate surroundings react to this tectonic change? Well, my, my wife almost divorced me. She literally almost divorced me because I changed so much. She didn't divorce me, but it was rough for a while. Um, some of my friends, uh, I lost one very good friend over it, um, but some of my friends were a little taken aback, but many accepted me just the way I was because we'd been friends for a long time. I mean, they said, oh, he's changed a little bit, but they didn't necessarily dislike and over time have come to like the change. Um, my, uh, my, my dad thought I joined a cult and was going to, that the high faith was going to take all my money. And he pretty much said that <laughs> for the next five years. He, he said, you know, you've joined a cult and, and this is terrible. And even I even did a presentation to his interfaith group and he was still very negative and kind of grumpy about the Baha'i faith because he lost 19 members of his family in the Holocaust. And so he said, you know, you've betrayed your family. 
And then about mm -hmm. uh, six months ago, my father called me crying and said, you know, I was wrong. You become a better person. And I just didn't see that. And I want you, I want to ask for your forgiveness. Uh, my mother was always actually pretty kind about it. My mother's kind about everything. Oh. Um, and she, she said to me, maybe about a year ago, she said, you know, I love you despite our religious differences. And I said back to her, I said, you know, mom, we think the same about everything. We always have. It's just I call myself a Baha'i and you call yourself Jewish. And she said, yeah, yeah, you're right. And she meant it. Uh, and I've had that reaction from other people. Once we start talking, as Baha'is, we believe all religion is essentially one. And so most of the core beliefs of the Baha'i faith are not radically different than, than Christianity or Judaism or Islam. The problem is, and this is why so many people turn away from religion, is that religion becomes a point of division. And as a Baha'i, I'm very strongly instructed. We are. All Baha'is are very strongly instructed not to make religion a point of division and to try to make it a point of unity. Exactly. Exactly. Because um, you even said the quote initially, right, that Abdul Baha spoke about where, you know, if religion is the cause of disunity and strife, it's better to not have religion at all. And um, it comes down to that, it being a point of unity, it being the not only the purpose of us as individuals to be united, but also to live in harmony, to live in this physical world as spiritual beings in harmony. But then the the, the question I would, um, or most people would now think of is, okay, if this Steve guy feels he, he transformed himself and everyone around him acknowledged this transformation at such an advanced mature age into being more centered in spirituality and, you know, embracing the Baha'i faith. The question that comes to mind is, well, what does it offer me? Now, is that a wrong way to look at it? What does it offer me? Yes, it is. It's the exact. Like, like what would at. you share when it comes to that? We, no one should choose a religion for what it offers you. You should choose a religion or any belief for what you can offer it. Ask not what you can do. Ask not what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country, according to John F. Kennedy. And, and that's what I would say about religion. Uh, don't look to religion to solve your problems, um, although it can be a bomb. But I would say um, we should look and try to be served wherever we go. How can religion help me be, be of more service to humanity? That's a really good question that I would ask. If I'm serving humanity, which is what all of us should do, I don't care whether you're an atheist or a believer like me, we should all be trying to make the world a better place. And if you have no interest in making the world a better place, then there's no reason to listen to me or anyone else because you don't care. But if you care about making the world a better place, whether you're religious or not, the question is, can this religion help me in making the world a better place? And I would say, not only can it help you, it is necessary. And I know those are very strong words, but to embrace the principles of the Baha'i faith is necessary for the world to heal itself. And you were starting to talk about some of those principles. I, I talked about racism. So one of the principles is that we're one human race, that as Abdul Baha said, judge a man or a woman by the color of their heart, not by the color of their skin. And we must work tirelessly all throughout the world to eradicate racism. You touched on sexism, the equality of men and women of men and women, equality of women and men. And so women must have full equality. And I, I think from what I've read, Norway's done a good job with that. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. I would say Norway has, if any country has reached it, it would be it would be Norway. So kudos to Norway for doing that. Another one is the earth is but one country, mankind and citizens. So it's not about Norway. It's about all the countries of the, of the world thriving. And to understand that someone from Saudi Arabia or someone from France or someone from even England, well, we won't talk about that, but even England might be equal to someone from Norway. And it's just, we're all God's children. And so this is where, where religion is this point of unity, because we are all children of the same God. We, we, we reside on the same earth. We breathe the same air. There's, there's a beautiful hidden word where it says, walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth. And we must be even as one soul. This is a... Um, he asks, you know, why have I created you all from the same dust? Oh, children of men. And, and, and I'm doing it in the wrong order. I actually know it by heart, but I'm giving you the basic ideas in that hidden word. And it's essentially that we're one human family. 
that lesson needs to be deep in our hearts. And that's where religion comes in. You can have an idea in your head, but it doesn't move people unless you move them by the heart. And, and you asked me a really good question. How did I get out of my own way? How did I stop being a Jew? Might maybe I really never stopped being a Jew. I, the beautiful thing is I didn't have to leave Judaism. I enhanced my Judaism by becoming a Baha'i. I'm a better Jew than I ever was, but I'm also a good Christian, I hope, on most days. And I try to be a good Muslim as well as being a Baha'i. We're, we're one religion, one faith, the world. It's the failure to realize that. And that is the cause of the wars. So you could, as many people in Norway have done, abandon religion altogether all, all and just say, you know what, I'm going to have nothing to do with religion. But that's like putting your head in the sand and saying, well, there's a lot of problems over there, but that's their problem. It's not mine. As we see in COVID, a little problem in Wuhan mm. can be a worldwide problem overnight. And we can't put our heads in the sand and ignore religion because it is the major problem in the world. And we need to go into religion to fix that problem. In other words, in order to fix the problem of religion, we actually need a religious solution because, the, you know, religion isn't going away. The majority of the people in the world are religious and will remain religious for some period of time. And there's a purpose to religion. It's, it's the other thing I always like to remind people is every great society in the history of the world has had religion at its base, if not every, most of the great societies. So if you look at the history of the world, there's there's a succession of golden ages, the kingdom of Israel that follows Moses, the great Persian Empire that lasts for a thousand years that follows Zoroaster 3000 years ago, the great Maurya Empire, which hits two million square miles, the greatest empire of its day that follows Buddha, the great Byzantine Empire that follows Jesus that lasts over a thousand years again, yeah. the, the golden age of Islam, which lasts over 500 years that follows Muhammad. These are all religious based. So. There's a there's a thought in the world today that religion can't do any good, that religion only does bad because we look at, for example, the government of Iran. We look at that and that's what we th see as a theocracy. Well, theocracy is government uh, in, in the name of God, but also in the spirit of God. And so there are no true theocracies in the world today. I'm not picking on that one particular government, but just saying that there is no example of a true theocracy today. And so a true theocracy would would be a. a a government where you would have the love that Jesus Christ taught, that Buddha taught, that Muhammad taught, the, the unity, the, the truth, the justice, the compassion, the mercy, all the divine virtues. And that's there. So people don't see that and they see falsity in the name of religion. And as you and I have both said, they're leaving that falseness. And I would ask people to consider that what they're leaving is not religion at all. It's superstition and worn out tradition blind dogma that has nothing to do with the teachings yep. of Christ and Muhammad and Moses and Baha'u'llah and all the divine messengers. I mean, you, you painted a beautiful picture with the timeline, you know, especially with the empires that did follow, you could say, the, the dawn of each religious epoch or each religion. And um, it really paints a picture of a parallel growth or a parallel a boost in mankind's spiritual and material growth, right? It's going hand in hand. And um, what's interesting is, obviously, it's 2021, and a lot of people, more and more people are leaning more towards, I would literally say, making science their religion. Personally, I think that is like the worst thing you could do because the foundation of science is skepticism right you need to be a, a, a huge skeptic to be a scientist because you have to have a hypothesis that turns into a theory it has to be tested and tested and tested and you always have to ask why 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 and and disprove and disprove and disprove and having that as a foundation of belief science alone will not work because then your foundation of belief is based on skepticism, right? It's based on disproving in order to grow. And now we see, obviously, if we flip... Go for it, go for it. Yes, in America, we have a problem with people <laughs> ignoring science, a huge problem with that, with COVID. And so what's happened is a lot of people aren't getting vaccinated. A lot of people didn't obey the COVID guidelines. It cost us... Mm -hmm 
hundreds of thousands of deaths here in America, and unneedlessly because people didn't believe in science. You know, the Baha'i faith is usually for science. And one of the tenets of the Baha'i faith is that science and religion must be in harmony. Essentially, what you need is both. And so, as you said, if you go to science alone, it's empty. There's no meaning. So what what is the meaning of a science-based life? There is none. Science gives you no meaning. Science just tells you what. And it's a beautiful and very necessary thing to make our lives better. It gives us airplanes and computers and and ways we can communicate from Norway to Chicago. It's quite amazing. Science is brilliant. My last call was with uh, the scientist, the great scientist, Dr. Jane Goodall. I actually just uh, had a a Zoom call with her right before this. And, you know, she's in England. So I'm having quite an eventful morning or it's afternoon now. Uh, Science is amazing and wonderful and we should all embrace science. But science cannot disprove religion, nor can religion disprove science. They are two different ways of of looking at a singular reality. And each has their purpose. Religion gives us the why. It gives us the colors in the world. What I mean by that is it gives us all of these divine virtues, beauty and kindness and love and truth, justice. Justice is so important. Um, The Baha'i writings also talk about the foundation of of the future Uh, world commonwealth, which will come where the world is united, but it's going to be the foundation. Baha'u'llah says the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Justice. And that justice is not scientific. It's spiritual. Love is not scientific. It's spiritual. Kindness is spiritual. Exactly. Unity is spiritual. Now, these things are also reflected in the material world. You can say that some of this can be proven in the material world as well. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no contest. There's no competition. We're in this together. You, you know, that reminds me actually of, um, you know, there were a couple of firesides that um, we were holding and we're still holding, but the topic of this fireside, so for those who don't know what firesides are, they're basically a, a gathering where we discuss questions pertaining to others religious or specifically the Baha'i faith's point of view but usually uh, a religious point of view and um, connecting it to either topics that are relevant at that day or science but the topic we had discussed was we were going through like a list of questions that science cannot answer right So we tried to find questions that literally science cannot answer alone. And we're trying to see are there connections in these questions that we need to gain the answers from religious scriptures where we actually have a practical, direct example of science and religion going hand in hand answering this question. Like any, pick any tool, you know, let's pick a... a, um, like a camera. A camera is not going to work if light doesn't bounce back from the subject into the lens, right? So it's a two-side thing. It's it's something to capture light and it's also something that is dependent upon light bouncing back. So you have two sides. So we were looking for something similar with questions that science couldn't answer alone and religion was needed. You know, both sides of the same coin. And one question that was really like you even brushed up on it, was was really uh, the pattern of all these nine questions we found. It was the why. It was, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is, or why do humans need to be born in a physical reality? Or before the Big Bang, why was the Big Bang a necessity? Or even you know, the theory of the Big Bang itself, science cannot answer if that is unequivocally the beginning of the universe or not. Was time and space invented before invented? Well, let's say, was time and space existing rather before the Big Bang? Well, absolutely, because, you know, the hyper-dense heat and particles and energies that were needed to create the Big Bang needed to be in a space, needed to form over time so time and space obviously already existed and these questions we kind of had to connect between the why and the sciences what 
because science is really good at explaining how things work, but never why they work. So how do you deal with the question or the problem of, well, if my five senses do not see or feel or sense these things, why should I even give it the day of light? Why should I even care about these things? They don't matter in my immediate life. They don't matter. I have to pay rent. I have to go to work. These are the things I have to do. I don't have time to be, you know, putting energy and time into things that I can't grasp or see. So how do you tackle that reality? So um, we live in a reality very much like the Matrix. Have you, you, you know, the very famous Matrix series of movies? Only in the Matrix, we... Of course, of course. Keanu Reeves was living in this reality that was really gruesome in reality. And then he perceived a beautiful reality. And I would... I would posit that our reality is actually the reverse of that. So were you, as many people do, l to limit yourself to the five senses? You're living in a small, tiny little box because we are primarily spiritual beings and you're depriving yourself. So tell me if, if, I, if I were to see justice, describe it just purely what color is justice? What color is joy? What color is love? What color is kindness? How large is it? Is it tall or is it short? This, does, what does it smell like? How does it taste? How does it feel? You can't describe any of these things with your five senses. So if you were to solely use your five senses, you would lose every spiritual joy. And if, even if you say, well, I only, I only care about the five senses, but I do experience these things, then guess what? You're using more than your five senses. You are actually in the spiritual world because we are primarily spiritual beings, but you're blind. Mm -hmm. You're like a blind person going through the world, experiencing the world of sight without opening your eyes. Jesus said the blind leading the blind. He was talking about the religiously blind who were so blinded by their dogma that they couldn't see the real true light of religion. And I would argue that we're in the reverse matrix. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd say is that most people I meet have no idea about the light. I feel sorry, actually, and I shouldn't say this, but I feel sorry because my eyes have been open to the light of the world and I can see beauty everywhere. I say it this way and I say it over and over again. I say to those of us who believe in God, we see the beauty of God brilliantly reflected in brilliant colors and lights and noises and smells in every living thing. And we, uh, and we know this is God and we feel it viscerally. And for those who look for God only in the physical universe, they say he doesn't exist. You have to not look for God in the physical universe because God doesn't exist. I am, and I have to say this very carefully, I am an atheist if you limit my view to the physical universe. But I don't. There's a spiritual world out there. Explore that spiritual world. Open your mind and your heart and most of all your soul. And all of a sudden you will see beauty beyond beauty that you have never seen. Now, people might say, I'm not interested in that. Then fine. Stay in your box. But if you want to have the greatest beauty, the greatest joy, the greatest comfort, the greatest yeah. satisfaction, I can't even describe it. I really don't have words to say it. I'll just say pure and un un unadulterated joy. <laughs> then come explore my world. Abdul Baha. So, um, Abdul Baha is was the exemplar, actually have a book right in front of me, Abdul Baha, the perfect exemplar that I'm reading right now. And he is, he was the son of Baha'u'llah. He was the self-actualized human. You know, I wouldn't look, I always, when I first became a Baha'i, someone said, well, don't look to the Baha'is to be an example, just look to the, the Baha'i faith. But if you really want to know what a human being a true human being was like, study the life and teachings of Abdu'l-Bahá. His absolute kindness, his love for everybody, his incredible, brilliant intellect. He talked about science quite a bit. Uh, great story about Abdu'l-Bahá in America when he came to mm -hmm. America in 1912. The um, Secretary of the United States Treasury was the next scheduled speaker after him. He went to Alexander Graham Bell's house, the, the, the same Alexander Graham Bell who, who invented the telephone. And he spoke there. And the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States was scheduled to speak after him. And he got up and he said, after that speech, 
I have nothing more to say. Now, let me just tell you a little bit more about that. Abdul Baha had no formal education. He was a prisoner under the Ottoman Empire for 55 years from the age of nine to 64. So he'd just been set free a few years ago. And here he was at 68, an old and relatively physically feeble man, entertaining the world's greatest intellects to such a level that the Secretary of the United States, the uh, Treasury, was speechless after, after listening to him. And this effect that Abdul Baha had was on person after person after person. I believe very strongly that, spirit, that, that spiritual knowledge is greater than intellectual knowledge, and it leads intellectual knowledge. And when the world matures spiritually, intellectual knowledge will flourish in its wake. It doesn't go the other way. In other words, we can be as intellectual as we want to be, but we may be lacking spiritually. Mm. But if we are truly spiritual, really spiritual, and this has been true. This is, this, this is what caused all these golden ages, which were always ages of great invention. Do you know that 75% of the inventions in the history of the world have been invented since 1844, which is the Baha'i era? We have just scratched the surface. The thing is, when the world becomes Baha'i, when the world understands that, you know, we, you and I, as, as, as fledgling Baha'is, as babies, because, you know, this is such a new revelation. Once the world really grasps the strength and power of this revelation and embraces this revelation, we will have, the world will be turned into a paradise. This is according to the Baha'i writings, not me. The world will be turned into a paradise that we cannot even fathom today, the likes the world has never seen. Now, I always say to people, if you have a better idea than that, if you have, if you, if you have a great idea on your own, for creating world peace, then I will become your follower. I'll stop following Baha'u'llah. I'll follow you. But before you do that, read Baha'u'llah's ideas. And then if your ideas are better, then give me a call. No one's taking me up on that yet, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that is perfect, man. That's that's exactly it. You, you said it right there. The, the recipe or the prescription to the maladies of the earth and and literally the answers to how we should take ourselves as a society forward has been written and prescribed by Baha'u'llah and in the Baha'i faith and there is nothing better out there and as you said if there is something better out there show me show me and uh, then we can have a discussion but you know until then we have to obviously deepen ourselves more within these writings and see how how much work is ahead as a species I'm talking about now, you know, as as a human race, how much work lays ahead of us in terms of uh, fulfilling and um, following this recipe to our true potential, to the utopia that is man's next evolutionary step. What about, because um, obviously now from the outside, we will see, okay, you're obviously successful with your relations. Now I'm talking friends, family, you know, you're married with kids. You're obviously a successful. Well, you know, my kids are 18. You, um, might, uh, you might not. Businessman. Uh, you, you have to ask my kids whether I'm a successful father. They're 18. And, 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 and when, you're eight, when they're 18, believe me. I've gotten a lot dumber in the last few years. So. <laughs> but go ahead. You know, Sorry the to fact that ahead. The fact that you even added that sentence for me just shows. No, it's fine. The, the fact that you added that sentence shows that, okay, you are indeed uh, uh, fulfilling a lot more from the outside as a successful father than uh, you think, you know, because you're humble and that comes through. So, we have at least certain proofs that, okay, you ha you're finding success in all these different fields and even in business, right? So a lot of people would be like, how do you balance all this? And not only all this, but you're hyper successful in business. There are not that many billionaires alive. And how do you balance that with the spiritual side? Is there a balance or is this already an excess? Um Baha'u'llah says that the rich, but for a few, um, for, for, but for a few rich people, wealth is actually a burden. It says it's very rare to have a wealthy person 
whose wealth has, has not kept them as a barrier between them and, and their desired goal, which would be to, one, to be one with God. So I think I have to remind myself every day that my, that my goal is, is Baha'u'llah, uh, the Baha'i faith, to serve the world. And not to be um, arrogant, not to get, not to get, not to hurt my hand, patting myself on my back, you know, and telling myself how great I am. I am. Wealth is no determinant of how good a person you are. What I try to get up every day, I pray every day. I literally get down on my hands and knees every day, and I pray to do God's will. And I think the way I, when I first became a Baha'i, I decided I didn't want to do business at all, and. I tried not to for a couple of years. And then I realized over time that I still in business ventures, I had to do something. So I, I started getting a little bit more involved with business again. And now I'm in this beautiful company with the amazing, and I have to give him a plug, Justin Baldoni, who's in Sweden right now. Um, don't, don't look for him, but because uh, he's on vacation. But um, Justin is my amazing partner. He's also a Baha'i. And we have a, a company called Wayformer. And uh, Wayfair Studios, and we're making these movies that touch the world. We made a movie called Clouds last year. Do you have Disney Plus in in Norway? Yes, we do have Disney Plus, and we, I at least I have seen well, Clouds. I highly, highly recommend it. It's actually a a, a movie about a young Catholic man who who is making. Uh, so it's not even you know we're not pushing the Baha'i faith or anything, but as as I've said earlier that. Uh, all faiths are one. And, and, and Zach was a beautiful spirit. And so his movie is beautiful because he was beautiful. He was a young boy who was dying, who wanted to make music. And he made a, a beautiful song called Clouds. And it went to number one on iTunes on the day of his funeral, actually. And it's a, it's a wonderful movie if you get a chance to see it. Um, Justin has also written a book called uh, Man Enough, which is really challenging men like you and me uh, to adjust to the world in a world where women are equal. What what do men have to do to stand up in this new age? And really, what does it mean to be a man? And he's questioning these age old ideas of what it means to be a man. Am I supposed to be rough and tough and be able to beat you up? Um, if so, I fail miserably because I've never been much of a fighter. But is, is, is a man someone who's virtuous? And I believe that's the case. Is it truly to be a man, to be a good husband, to be a good father, to be a good friend? What would women want from a man? They might want a, a man who's, who's tall and strong and handsome, but they might also want a man who's honest and kind. I, I have a, a female friend who's been married for, I think it's 30 years, and she found out her husband just told me last week her husband was cheating on her. And I feel terrible about that for her, but I feel even worse about it for him because she's a lovely person and he's going to lose his wife and family because he didn't understand his higher calling as a human being and that there's more important things than the physical desires. Sometimes it's hard to understand that, but it's, this is something that we all need to do. We all need to elevate spiritually. And that's what Justin's book is about. And that's what our, our company is about. And going back to business now, everything I do in business, I'm trying to take these Baha'i principles. So in Paylocity, which is the company that went public, um, I had a talk last week with our, our DEI team, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and, our, and, our, and the team that, that does uh, nonprofit work. And uh, so it was really um, amazing that uh, I was able to talk to him about some of the things I'm doing to fight racism and, and then take, so it, it kind of comes full circle. My, my company is doing things to fight racism and I'm now saying, here's the resources I have to help you. And the other thing I wanted to do was get some, get people of color on our board because we had a very white, we had a hundred percent white board, which didn't make sense to me as a Baha'i. Um, I didn't start the company as a Baha'i. Mm -hmm. and, and so now we have a, we didn't have any women on our board a few years ago. So now we have women on our board. We have one person of color. We need more. And, and the reason we need that is not to check a box and say, hey, we have a person of color on our board. The reason to do that is to make our board and our company and everything I do look like the human family. Because if we don't, there's an element of prejudice involved. And there's an element yeah. of being unbalanced. And we are not reaching our true potential. Um, so I like, I'm being six yeah. foot six, I like basketball. And, you know, a team of all centers would not do so well, or a team of all guards, unless they were Michael Jordan, would not do too well. 
what you need is a balance and we need the eyes of everybody and we need the experience of everybody. And if you only have one type of person, you end up in a, with an off balance view of life. And so not coincidentally, we invested in something called, with yeah. the NAACP, which is the national, um, uh, the national association for the advancement of colored people in, uh, in America. And we invested in something called an ETF, which is an investment vehicle on the, on the New York stock exchange. And we're making a 70% return over the course of three years. Mm. What we're doing is investing in companies that are basically anti-racist, that are, that are doing the things that we're talking about, putting people of color in key management positions and having good programs, et cetera. And it really makes a lot of sense, but moreover, it works. And so who knew that by doing good, you could actually make money? It sounds like an amazing strategy and obviously it is you know you invest in basically the seeds of what you want the future garden to look like right so you're investing in companies that are uh, inclusive companies that do share uh, anti-racial uh, let's say thoughts and not only that but you know do provide with the necessary means and the necessary actions to eradicate these prejudices but then do you have specific metrics to identify these companies? And how would you, if you do have specific metrics, how would you relay these metrics into, you know, startups? What should they focus on? You know, is there something they need to do to, as you said, curve this prejudice as well as uh, uh, make money while doing good, basically? Um, so first of all, you know, right from the start, you should look towards diversity. And so diversity, and I can't talk to Norway, but I can tell you that in America, the one of the biggest hindrances is not out and out, I hate black people or I hate brown people. It's that you go to your network and you hire the people you know. Oh, I know this great guy named Steve. I'm going to hire him. I'm going to, I know this person named Mike and I'm going to hire him. And, and all of a sudden I've hired all white men. My network, your network tends to look like you. Yeah. Well, because in, in America, the network has been really run, the country has been run by white men, white men like me, and I, I'm going to not excuse myself from this, have generally hired white men. And I did. I, I hired mostly white men to run my company. And they did a fine job, and they're doing a fine job. But I'm extremely proud of our CEO, Steve Beauchamp, because he has embraced this idea that... Um, that we are a diverse society and he has really embraced making our company more diverse. I think diversity is really good. Number two, I would say, um, always do what's, what's right. So have a really high standard of ethics. So what we did at Wayfair, which is really a startup, our movie company is we put in the Baha'i values and what's really interesting is we had somebody who we recently let go who wasn't, who wanted to live up to the values, but was not consistently wasn't living up to the values. And when we finally made a decision that we were going to make a change, our employees came to us and really thanked us for living up to the values. Cause, cause what we did is we expressed the values and then we had, a, then, then we're held to that standard. And when I'm talking about, we, I mean, Justin and I are held to our own standards. So if you have this very high standard of morals and ethics, people will be much more loyal to you. Um, people will really like their jobs, you know, when they see that you're doing something mm. special. Um, if you're in this type of company, and I've seen this over and over again, where it's, even if it's go, 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 and we're going to, you know, I, there was a company, I remember uh, that they drank a lot of alcohol, and they had parties on the floor. And, you know, they, more than that, you know, a lot of, you know, out, drug, sex and rock and roll, right in there. And it's, it was the fun company. And our company is not like that. We have no alcohol on premises. But that company imploded after uh, a year or two. That company had a huge valuation and imploded because they didn't have moral standards. And the CEO was let go and they were consistent in everything they did. They lied. They didn't have honesty. You see, what's interesting is God's standards work. Mm. Honesty. One of the things we do is a, it's called Baha'i consultation. And what we do is we bring other opinions in and we talk. And yeah, we might disagree, but through those disagreements comes truth. But the way you do it in the Baha'i world is it's not my opinion is my opinion. Yeah. Darn you. And I'm going to fight you and I'm going to beat you with my opinion. 
until until you beat you into submission until you get it right or vice versa you beating me with your opinion i throw it out there and then it's our idea and then you throw it out there and it's our idea mm -hmm. and so we talk about their ideas and i may end up embracing your idea and discarding mine mm -hmm. or vice versa or some combination thereof the key is to let the ego go and to detach from your own ideas because that's essentially it right we get inspired with ideas and they come through us they're not of us they're not from us it is not us so we can't attach our ego we can't attach our self-identity to something coming through us and thus even if it comes through you or from you if it's from your ego then it will come from you right the group the the consultation within that group will either enhance if it's the truth or dismiss if it's false or the ego and that is the beauty of the Baha'i consultation it it solves itself you know if done properly as the Baha'i cons consultation needs to be done so it absolutely you know taking this into a business standpoint is absolutely an edge it is it is <laughs> fundamentally an edge because um, okay I have a couple of startups myself and one of them we actually had this um I don't want to call it, uh, well, it was an issue because most startups have issues in the beginning, right? But it was an issue because not everyone in our group subscribed to this Baha'i way of consultation. And it's, it's very difficult to teach people this. So I'm wondering, how do you teach people who probably don't subscribe to the Baha'i consultation? Or maybe when they do subscribe to it, one person really doesn't. So how do you guide him into truly understanding that this method of consultation not only is it superior but it needs to become a habit for the greater good of let's say the institution the company the family whatever well it helps that i'm at the helm of the businesses and so when people see that i've been successful already so that kind of gives me a little credibility going in um, and then people are at least willing to try it once they try it it you know, what's really interesting in our family foundation, which my wife is not a Baha'i, but the family foundation embraces consultation, Baha'i consultation. Everyone is very proud that they do it. And you can have this consultation. You don't have to be a Baha'i to embrace it. What you do have to do, and, and I tell people that, I tell people that all the time. This is, you know, this is a Baha'i concept, but you can use it if you're not a Baha'i. And the people try, they start it, they understand it, and then they sometimes take it outside of the first place they used it and bring it to their workplace because it works so well. The, I guess the easiest way to, to, to sell it is to have people say, try it, see if it works. And once they try it and they see how well it works, they, they, they embrace it, they love it, and they use mm -hmm. it everywhere they can. And that's what I do is I, I take these Baha'i principles and I use them wherever I can. Um, one of the things that the Baha'i faith says absolutely not to do is backbiting. So at Wayfair, we forbid backbiting. Now, how many companies do you know that have in their bylaws, you can't talk badly about people behind their back? That seems like, you know, really? But it's very harmful to do that. And so not to say we're perfect, but that is in our bylaws. And people think about it. And so as you start putting these principles in place, your company starts running better and better and better because people start running on a more unified basis. And so it's really, you know, it's, we are human. Justin and I are human. We don't understand the faith perfectly. Our employees are human. They don't understand mm. that many of them. In fact, most of our employees are not Baha'is. The important part is to take these principles and put them mm. in every aspect of your life and to do them as best as you can. So far, Wayfair is doing okay. We had a, a big... I think I think Wayfair is going to be a, a very successful company. And I have a little track record that says maybe I know what I'm talking about. Um, we have a few other movies that I'm very excited about. Uh, <laughs> we have a podcast, uh, the Man Enough podcast, which we just finished. Um, and I think most importantly, people are really excited to work there. And we were named by uh, Fast Company magazine, one of the 10 most innovative um, media companies in the world. And we're, we're just really brand new. It's quite amazing. You just started because now we have um, podcasts, we have the, the movie or streaming movie industry. But then my question is, 
for the listeners as well what specific impact are you wishing to create with wayfarer like what is the i don't use the word genre but what is the theme of impact that is going to come out of this brand new company when you look at most movies and most tv shows you don't really get a lot of spiritual values you know if you take like for example the superhero movies and some of the other movies that are dominant most movies are there to entertain you we're not trying to entertain you we are trying to entertain you but our primary mission at wayfair is to uplift you our primary you, you take the movie clouds which you saw how did you feel when you when you were done with clouds honestly it was a emotional roller coaster first of all but it gave it gives the viewer a kind of um, security and purpose if that makes sense and that was what i kind of got away from it right that that was my takeaway it was a security and purpose you know it was like yes i need i am where i need to be type of security and purpose and i truly enjoyed that the theme of that movie was you don't have to be dying to begin living what what zack here this you know here's what we're learning from this 17 year old boy who's exactly. di- who's, who's dying is is you don't have to be dying to begin living start living your life to its fullest today and live every day as if it's your last because exactly. you don't know that's that's in the bahai writings that says bring yourself to account each day ere thou art summoned to a reckoning for death unheralded shall come upon thee and so what the bahai writings are saying none of us know when we're going to die it could be today it could be tomorrow it could be 50 years from now we don't know for me it's probably less than 50 years because i'm 55 but but whatever it is it is and and actually the beautiful thing in the bahai faith is that death is not death it's a birth it's 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 like coming into this world when the baby dies out of the womb and is born into this world it depends on which side you look at it if you look at it from this side it's a celebration so death to me is a celebration because i'm looking at it from the side of the other side the next world and saying my god i'll be a baby a new spiritual baby in the next world i'll have died out of this world and be being born into the next one but anyway that i digress yeah. Um what Wayfair is trying to do is to make the world a better place with every movie we make. Some of our movies several are against uh racism. We have a movie called Badass Biker Chicks of Marrakesh which is against sexism. We have a movie we're just going into production about Craig Hodges who was a, an American basketball player and he fought racism and was blackballed, kicked out of the league even though he won two straight championships and three straight three-point championships. He was only 31 years old. So we have we have a lot of different wow. our our movies are to entertain you to be interesting to be exciting. We're going to tell very good stories and we're going to try to do it in a really entertaining way. But those stories have a meaning and a purpose. Life is not empty. When you when you see a Wayfair movie, we want you to be we want you to leave that theater a slightly better person because of it. To have learned something, to have been inspired. That is the purpose of Wayfair. And I'll say it another way. This is our way of teaching the faith without ever saying the word bahai. These are all the principles of the faith against racism, against sex, mm. against nationalism, against religious prejudice. We have a, a a TV show we're very excited about called Little Mosque on the Prairie to show Muslims in in a in a much better light than they're traditionally shown in. And so which is interesting because as you know bahais are incredibly persecuted around the world by by Muslims. But we as bahais want to uplift the view of Muslims. And then the reason is that yes, we are persecuted in some areas by Muslims, but most Muslims who, you know, just like most Christians are just trying to lead a life. And if you're a good Muslim, you're a good Christian. If you're a good Christian, you're a good Muslim. Indeed. Indeed. One faith, one God. Indeed. W- would there ever be a or is there a Bahai project that has been in the works or is in the works? I we do know like you said you have a kind of deliberately done it around different religions to kind of teach the faith without actually or teach rather the principles of the faith which are found in all faiths without actually you know having to say the word bahai but the unifying vision of all religions and the principles are the same so would there be ever a specific bahai series movie uh we have a movie we're working on whatever in the uh, works is that something that has been thrown across t- Yes, absolutely. I have a whole separate company called Spring Green and all Spring Green does is Bahai, pure Bahai. 
And Justin and I are co-chairmen of both companies. Mm. So um, Spring Green is a little quieter right now, but we have a movie about Tahare. And that movie, we're very excited about. It's on the script level right now. Hopefully in mm. a couple of years, it will be out. And Tahare was one of the first followers of the Bob, the herald prophet of the Baha'i faith. And she was this amazingly brilliant and beautiful woman. She pulls off her burqa in 1848 and announces a new age for all humanity. And she says that there's new laws for all humanity. And one of those new laws is that women are absolutely equal to men. Anyone who has anything to do with women's rights should watch this movie. Tahare was amazingly brilliant, amazingly beautiful, amazingly steadfast. Um, she ends up um, teaching this new faith. And from behind a curtain, she simply embarrasses the male scholars who try to argue against her. Eventually, they killed over 20,000 followers of the Bab, and they start killing all the leaders. And eventually, the king says to her, Tahare, I'll save you. I'll marry you. And she turns down a marriage proposal from the king. Instead, she goes to her death. Right before she dies, she puts on her wedding dress and she says, you can kill me as soon as you like, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. I think this will be an amazing movie. Goosebumps, man. It's absolutely needed. The story of Tyra is, is something that needs to echo, honestly, um, within every type of media and really needs to be revisited by everyone. It's, I, I'm glad that's the one you guys picked. There are so many fantastic tales of and battles of justice, equality. But um, that's, a, that's a really nice place to start when it comes to the stories of the Baha'i faith. Um, so I do not want to take too much of your time. And honestly, we would love to have you back. So it's always better to cut it short and sweet than to prolong it. But I want to ask, before we go for the closing final statements, I want to ask... What is in Steve's head when he wakes up in the morning? What excites Steve? What gets that smile on his face? The world is, uh, is curious. Every day, I just want to do something to make the world a better place. So today, I'm actually headed to the beautiful Baha'i Temple in Wilmette, Illinois. It's 20 minutes away. So today, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so today, just give you what my day was today, and I'll give you an idea what puts a smile on my face. Uh, the first hour and a half of my morning was dedicated to uh, social justice. I am um, working on uh, philanthropy and social justice with my local community, studying uh, a Baha'i book, actually this book right here, which is uh, Rui 13, which is a Baha'i study group, and it's engaging in social action from a Baha'i Point of view. So I, I studied that for an hour and a half with my local community here in Highland Park, Illinois. Then I introduced Jane Goodall, who I love, 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 love Jane Goodall, because she is an advocate for all of God's creatures, including humans. She was a UN peace ambassador, and I've been fortunate enough to, to have met her and, and become friends with her. So we got to uh, introduce her, although she's in England right now, and of course, doing this wonderful podcast. And then my next thing is giving a tour of the Baha'i Temple uh, in 40 minutes. So, uh, just, I'm just happy because every, you know, all day long I get wow. to do things that hopefully will help people just a little bit. My thought is that I, I just want to touch people's hearts every day. If I can somehow say something that helps people, uh, do something that helps a human being. One thing that's really cool. Uh, and you can look this up. I put, po um, posted on Facebook, um, it's um, on Instagram. We got uh, the Wayfair Foundation. Uh, and if, if you can't find it, I'll, I'll email it to you. I'll send you a link. We just gave uh, a woman who's dying her her wish, her dying wish, is, which was to play in the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. So the fact that I can do wow. these things um, is really cool. Just try to make some try to make the world a better place for just a yeah. single person. And, you know, you don't have to be rich like me to do this. You, everyone could do that. Just get up every day and say, hey, I want to just make one person happy. I want to smile at someone. I want to be friendly to someone. I want to be friendly to someone who doesn't look like me. I want to defend someone's rights who doesn't look like me. I want to, if I'm white, defend black people. If yeah. I'm black, defend white people. If I'm, if I'm a man, defend women. I want to make the world a more just, verdant, and 
yeah. enlightened place. That's what makes me happy every day. I get up out of my bed trying to do that. And I fail every day, by the way, and then I get up and try to do it the next day. I do the best I can. I don't want to say I'm Abdul Baha because I'm not, but I try <laughs> every day to be him. And then I fail and then I try. The <laughs> Honestly, um, the, the, if I could sum what I've just heard in one word, it is service. You know, it seems like service is so centered in your life in payroll, in wafer, in, in in basically everything you do to such an extent that you wake up and that's the first thing on your mind. And what's interesting is I was not also sure what to expect, right? When uh, we were like, okay, let's do this podcast because we, we always do it in person. But I was like, okay, you know, you are a very interesting, let's say, um, individual set up with very unique pieces of puzzles right the jewish heritage now a baha'i a billionaire baha'i and also now impacting with service both the social cultures breaking the prejudices and through the media uh, um, you know wayfarer so it's it's a very unique set of skills that are combining and coming together to basically change what i would say change the world into a better or closer to a better place so we couldn't you know skip the chance of having this podcast you know it's not ideal over zoom but better not ideal than not at all so that's my takeaway from this interaction and i couldn't be more grateful that you shared our time with us and um, even though it was as i said i did not know what to expect right it was beyond expectations it was it was a blessing to listen to your point of view especially as a Baha'i you know it has been my pleasure and just tell Mr. Ingebrigtsen tell tell Mr. Yaakov Ingebrigtsen that there's some really fast Americans and he's not gonna he's not gonna have it easy in the 1500 at the Olympics okay <laughs> just I just I want to put I want to throw down the gauntlet here <laughs> honestly watch out for Cole Hawker Dude, honestly um I will try to get in contact with him <laughs> <laughs> I will try to get in contact with him. Honestly, it's not going to be that hard because I do know people on the national Norwegian team. I was on the national Norwegian team in track and field myself. So I will try and get that f and do that service for you. And maybe when you're in Norway, hey, maybe there would be a meeting in store. Like uh, I love seeing a fellow track member excited about such. Uh, it was truly a pleasure to have you on. So whenever you want to have maybe a closing statement, let me know. And... Um, then we we'll wish everyone goodbye. Every day, try to look deep within your heart and try to ask yourself, what can you do to make the world a better place? Even if it's just to help one person, you don't have to be rich like me. You don't have to be famous. Just do your best to make the world better for one person other than yourself today and every day. And let me tell you, that will make you a happier person. It'll probably make you wealthier too, actually, believe it or not. But wealth it'll give you the true wealth and that's spiritual wealth so remember that true wealth is spiritual try to uplift your spirit every day it will make for a much happier and more fulfilling life beautiful thank you very much thank you for your time and uh hopefully we'll do this now. in person looking forward to it <laughs>